Thank you. Thank you very much. I am uh, delighted and honored uh, to be here. And when I heard this story about what they did, and I think it was August of 07, was it, when you sold out to Goldman Sachs? Uh, I thought, this is just fabulous. So when you hear uh, and you see some of the slides I have where Ben Bernanke and some of the folks didn't see this thing coming, I mean, and these are the people who are running our government, what does that tell you? That's, that's really all you need to know. I think the speech is over. I'm out of here right now. That's, that's really all you need to know. So what I would like to do, though, I, I have a lot of uh, slides here, but I'm not going to, I'd really rather not do a whole slide presentation if it's okay with you. I'd really like to just visit with you about your thoughts and ideas and take your questions. Is that, is that acceptable to you? I'll give you a little of this just to give you some idea. But um, I want to say, that we need, I need to do a disclaimer first. I, I have a lot of colleagues of mine here from the University of Texas at Dallas, and so they're over here, David, Pamela. Brittany, I don't know who else is around yet, but anyway, uh, great school, love teaching there, all that stuff. I am not, the comments I am making are not made on behalf of the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, David Daniel, if he were here, or Hassan Perkul, who's the dean of the school, David's the president, would say to you, Dennis, what are you saying here? Okay, so, so do not think that at all. What I'm saying is, I'm on, is that okay, David? Is that enough of a disclaimer? Okay, good. Academic freedom, yeah. I got academic freedom, but also, um, you know, the university tries to stay uh, pretty much apolitical about stuff, and rightfully so, I think. So, uh, but what I'm going to say are some things that are probably not too politically correct. I'm going to tell you what I think, not to say that that is the right thing, but I will, I will never pull any punches on uh, what I think about these things. That's what you're asking me to do, I think. You don't have to agree with it, uh, but uh, keep that in mind. I have one of my favorite slides is this one. Uh, one of my favorite bumper stickers is this one, and that's don't believe everything you think. Uh, because what happens is in this world, we have a tendency to believe, so I have a friend of mine who's a good, well, I call him, depending on what day of the week it is, liberal, socialist, progressive, wherever he is on that part of the spectrum. And uh, he believes everything that Paul Krugman writes, as an example. And he keeps, he, he, I just can't imagine those right-wingers and blah, 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 blah. And I said, Tommy, if you would read what somebody else wrote, you might see something that somebody else thinks. And I have a lot of good conservative friends of mine who uh, only read the heritage things, only read this stuff. And they go, how, do, how can it be possible that those absolute liberal communists, you know? I said, what are you reading? Well, I'm, I said, would you read something else? And instead of watching Fox News, watch NBC, MSNBC, get mad for a while. Or if you watch MSNBC, watch Fox and get mad for a while. At least understand what the other sides are saying. So I don't, I don't belong to any political party. I don't talk about partisan politics. I'm as mad about both parties as I am about one. So if that tells you anything about where I'm coming from here. So we have um, this idea of what caused the credit crisis. Let me start by asking you what caused the credit crisis. And I have given you a cheat sheet here in which I've listed uh, 21 causes of the credit crisis, and there may be more, I don't know. But um, who would like to volunteer to tell me what they think caused the credit crisis? CRA. Pardon me? CRA. So the CRA, how many of you have heard of the Community Reinvestment Act? Let's see, raise the hands. Okay. Pretty knowledgeable audience, which I expected. How many of you are recovering bankers like I am? And, <laughs> see, and some of you are present bankers, and, and I think it was Jana. Where is Jana? Jana said she just looked forward to being a recovering banker one of these days. Jana makes, uh, Jake's, makes pardon me? SBA loans, SBA loans. I said, how's the funding coming along? She said, not real well right now. You know, so she has some issues there on the funding with Fidelity Bank out of uh, Georgia, as I recall. So anyway, the, the idea about um, the CRA is something, if it's okay with you, we'll just start there. Because uh, if you took all those 21 things that you have on there, um, it is really, in my opinion, the idea behind CRA that is the major culprit in the whole thing. Now let me hesitate to say this. There have been a lot of studies done. It was not CRA loans per se that caused the crisis. Let's be clear about that. There are a lot of loans in the CRA area, but there are not enough of those to cause the crisis. But it was the philosophy behind it. And let's talk about that philosophy behind it if we can for a minute. I've given you on that sheet uh, a lot of books on the, the other side. So if you'll just turn over to the books I am not suggesting that you go get all these books and read them. In the first place, you would want to commit suicide by the time you got through the first three. So don't even think about 
doing that because uh, some of us are book people. And what I'd like, the ones I'd like to suggest that you think about as it relates to this, however, are these. And there's one right there in the middle. It's a new book out just this year called Bad History, Worst Policy, How a False Narrative About the Financial Crisis Led to the Dodd-Frank Act by Peter Wallison. Who knows Peter Wallison? Anybody know who Peter, okay, you know who he is anyway. Peter Wallison was on our television program along with Harvey Rosenblum with the Dallas Fed earlier this year. By the way, the website's on the back of there. You can see the last hundred programs on the web in case you don't know anything about our television program on Sunday afternoons. But you can see that. I call, should we break up the big banks? So Peter Wallison is a, um, I would call him a conservative. He's with the American Enterprise Institute, and that's a conservative uh, organization, to say the least. But he's a financial guy who's written about this thing for many, many years. The, he was writing about it at the time that all this was going on. And in fact, he wrote, uh, there was a, an article in the New York Times on September the 30th, 1999. Do you guys remember this article? The New York, just checking, see if you remember that. September 30th, 1999. It was written about um, what the government had wanted Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to do in order to make more affordable housing loans. This was in 1999. And Franklin Raines, who at that time was the head of Fannie Mae, said, uh, this is great. This is going to be great. We're going to be able to make loans to those people who just, whose credit score is just a skosh low and who don't have quite as much of down payment and that sort of thing. It's going to be great. Peter Wallison was quoted in that article as saying, what this is going to do is create another SNL type credit crisis is what's going to happen. Now, I don't know about you. I kind of like to look back at what the people said before it happened and to listen to the people who knew what was going to happen as opposed to Ben Bernanke who had no clue about what was going to happen, and still doesn't, in my opinion, about what caused it or anything else. So um, that's why I think Peter Walson's interesting. This book is a lot about the stuff he wrote, but it's all about what his position was in 2010. Peter Wallison was one of nine members of the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission. The Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission looked into this whole crisis in, in 2010, and uh, they were trying to figure out what caused the crisis. Now, they made the report in 2011. Peter Wallison made a minority report of that. And what happened was is that he said whatever uh, Phil Angelides and the other people said happened wasn't true. So he did his own minority report. Now, interestingly enough, the Dodd-Frank law was passed in July of 2010. So this is the way government works. We appoint a commission to find out what the causes of the problem were. At the same time, we pass a law six months before the report is issued on what the causes were so we can solve the problem before we know what caused it. Only in America did this happen. Uh, so when you get down to what was at the root of this thing, in my opinion, you get down to several people's thinking and you get down to a philosophy. The philosophy is simply this. People are not qualified to take care of themselves. Some people make more money. Some people are smarter. That's not fair. What we need to do is to help people who cannot help themselves. And the way we do that is by giving them other people's stuff. That's called redistribution, last I checked. Now, we're in the redistribution business. We're a welfare state. We've been a welfare state for a long time. We are not going to be a very successful welfare state if we keep doing this because what happens is we create these credit crises, which is bad for all of us who've been in the financial industry for most of our lives. But ask yourself this question. Do you really help people by getting them into a situation they can't afford? Do you really help people by loaning them more money than they can pay back? Do you really help people by giving them an adjustable rate mortgage that is only this right now? And by the way, it's going to be fine because later on you'll make more money and when, and when you have to refinance it, the rates will still be low, no problem. Besides, real estate prices we know only go up, especially in California, Las Vegas, Florida, and Arizona. So I've got on there a lot of things that tie into all this. One is something called stupidity. Okay? We have had a lot of stupid borrowers. You know, they look to us, those of us who are in the banking business, they look to us for good advice, and I suspect they get it from most of the people here. But we have some people who got involved in this trying to help others because there's always people who are trying to game the system and make a lot of money out of it, wouldn't you say? 
hey, no problem with that. And so how do we do this? So who are the players that feed into all of this? And one of those players, one of my favorite players, has since died, fortunately. His name is Roland Arnold. Anybody, who knows the name Roland Arnold? Anybody? How many of you remember when the Arlington Stadium out there for the Rangers was called America West Field? How many of you remember the America West Field? That was Roland Arnold. Roland Arnold was a real estate guy uh, out of Orange County, California. Gave a lot of money, millions of dollars, to both political parties, in particular George W. Bush. He gave George Bush a whole lot of money. And uh, so much money, in fact, that George Bush appointed him as ambassador to the Netherlands in 2006. I thought that was wonderful. Got my, at least all the problems he cr create in this subprime stuff. He was in the Netherlands uh, whining and dining and people over there while we were over here dealing with the issue. I thought that was great. So like I say, Roland Arnold since died, which is great because he didn't have to, we don't have to deal with him anymore. You know, the rest of these people, we're recycling these other people. We're recycling the other people, most of them in the government position. So there we are. So we had Roland Arnold AmeriQuest. All of you have heard of Countrywide, I assume, correct? Countrywide, a uh, guy named Angelo Mozillo. Everybody was friends of Angelo. Uh, so let me go back to Franklin Raines. Franklin Raines was a friend of Angelo's. Uh, Countrywide made him alone while he was running Countrywide. Countrywide provided the biggest amount of, uh, let's just say, a product into Fannie Mae and to Freddie Mac. And uh, Franklin Raines, uh, when they decided in 2002 that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who are government-sponsored enterprises, I think all of you know GSEs, they decided they have to do accounting like everybody else. And when they did that, they found out that Fannie Mae, lo and behold, had 101 accounting violations. Can you believe this? Can you believe a government agency would have 101 accounting violations? Shocking, shocking. And so when they did that, Franklin Raines ended up uh, getting fired. Now, when Franklin Raines was fired in 2004, he walked out with a $240 million exit package. Does that get people's attention? And he got sued. He had to give $60 million of it back. Poor guy. Franklin Raines and the guy who was before him, a guy named Jim Johnson, ran Fannie Mae. And his C, um, CFO was a guy named Tim Harper. These people were in there doing all this wonderful stuff, gaming the system, changing the numbers so that their bonuses would be met appropriately. Fannie Mae grew from... I don't know, these are numbers off the top of my head, they're somewhere in this flat presentation. Maybe 600 billion in, I'm gonna say 1996, to seven trillion by 2007. I don't know about you, that's pretty good growth, wouldn't you say? Uh, and a lot of this was driven by several things. Let me go back to what that was for. Let's start, first of all, the Community Reinvestment Act, 1977, under Jimmy Carter. I was a full-time banker at the time, I remember it very well, and I said, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. They didn't put a lot of teeth into it, however. However, as the years passed, uh, examiners would come in and they were required to ask us about were we making loans in different places what because there was redlining I mean there are bankers who didn't make loans in places where people wouldn't pay them back I mean what a shocking thing you know I can't imagine that but anyway um, so you were then rated as to how you were on CRA later we had something called Humda which I want to don't going to get into and so in the 90s now under George HW and under Bill Clinton there started to be a push to make more of these affordable housing loans. And at the time when the, there was a bill passed in 1992 or 1994, I can't remember exactly which it was, anyway, that required then Fannie and Freddie, these two government-sponsored enterprises, to make 30% of the loan to, quote, affordable housing. That got changed from 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and then finally in the early 2000s to 56% of their loans they were required to have in, quote, affordable housing loans, which meant loans that by definition were poor quality. Now, it wasn't all just subprime. Maybe you hear the word, by the way, subprime was the word of the year for, 19, for 2007. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but the American Dictionary Association, whatever it's called, subprime was the word of the year in 2007. Anyway, so they weren't all subprimes. They were all day loans. They were uh, adjustable rate mortgage loans, all of, most of them made out in California. And they were loans you've heard of, ninja loans, right? Ninja loans, I love American ninja. Actually, I like, you know, Japanese ninja. But anyway, no income, no jobs, no assets, ninja loans, you know. Low doc loans, low documentation loans. No doc loans, no documentation loans. Um, so in 2007, when you guys were selling out here, which is what you should have done, uh, some of us were looking at this thing, and I've been looking at this thing since the late 90s because I, I have friends of mine in the mortgage business, and they were telling me that, they said, I can't, I can't make a loan because somebody else over here is making a loan that with nothing. I mean, there's, the appraisals are, you know, appraisal fraud, rampant. 
through all this whole time. By the way, starting in the 90s, this is not you know, appraisal fraud, all this stuff. So anyway, uh, we make all these uh, loans, adjustable type loans with fraudulent appraisals. Everybody's getting a fee. Nobody is underwriting the credit. That is, nobody's deciding whether they're going to make them paid or not because you don't need to because you're going to sell it to somebody else. So the mortgage companies primarily, wasn't primarily banks, wasn't primarily community banks in particular. Mortgage companies, AmeriQuest, Countrywide, IndyMac, WAMU was a big thrift of doing the same thing. They had something called Long Beach Savings. They made one guy who was a, uh, a worker in the fields in California. He had an income of $14,000 a year. That was his income, $14,000. They loaned him $720,000 to buy this house. I don't know about you, but $14,000 income, difficult to service a $720,000 mortgage. But that's the kind of stuff that was going on. The other thing that was going on back in those days, a friend of mine's in the mortgage uh, checking documentation business, told me about a lady in Las Vegas. And they, one of the banks that they were working with here in town, whose name I won't mention, had made a bunch of loans in Las Vegas in the early 2000s. And they went, they couldn't find the, after two or three payments were made and then no more payments were made, mail was returned, the whole bit. So they had so many loans in Las Vegas, they got on a plane and went to Clark County, Nevada, and they couldn't find the people who were the um, borrowers. So they went down to the Clark County Courthouse and started to see if they could find something. Here was this one lady as an example. They made her a $300,000 loan, and she quit paying after three payments. They looked at the county records, and they found out that she had sued somebody else, and that suit was against the mortgage company that they had bought it from. They looked at the pleadings in the suit, and she said, you promised me a $42,000 fee if I would let you take my, my credit and my name to sign this deal, and you never paid me the $42,000 fee, and I'm suing you for my $42,000 fee. So here was a fraudulent transaction where she had just gave, given her credit and all that stuff, and then was promised a $42,000 fee, and then she got mad because she didn't get the $42,000. And that was rampant everywhere. Uh, so, and then the other thing that this said was, oh, you know, let's just take, let's loan money to investors. And so people would go into a Las Vegas subdivision, buy 15 houses, and uh, sign it with no documentation at all, because they could sell it upstream. Fannie and Freddie, and I'm going to get to the Wall Street banks in a minute because they're part of the problem as well. But anyway, this whole idea of making things uh, a better to other people uh, got totally skewed out of place because people then found out that in a GSE you can make a whole lot of money, and um, if you didn't, things didn't go well, well, the taxpayers would bail us out anyway. That was only possible for one other reason. I'm going to go to the next reason here, and that is the lobbying that went on. Fannie and Freddie were the two of the top five lobbying firms in Washington, D.C. in the 90s and 2000s. They kept people in Washington. One of them's name is Barney Frank. You may have heard of Barney Frank. One of them's name is Chris Dodd. The irony of that we could have a law called Dodd-Frank of two guys who were so obviously in the middle of causing the problem is just an amazing situation to me. I guess I shouldn't be surprised given what I've seen in my lifetime. But fortunately, neither one of them is in Congress anymore. That's the only good thing you can say about it. Uh, I've got a few things that uh, Barney Frank said at the time. Maybe I can play that for you or look at, show you that, and you'll see what I mean if I can find all this. But um, uh, first, let me just say, Henry, Henry Paulson, who was Secretary of the Treasury, uh, this was, uh, oh, this is my quote. Before we can understand the future, we have to know where we are. In order to understand where you are, we have to understand the past. So I'm trying to talk about the causes of these things. This is what my son said to me about history. He said, sure, you were good at history, Dad. You were there for most of it. You know, so that's the deal. Uh, <laughs> and this is a quote I came up with in 1970. The history of banking has been the history of government intervention. It has been from the beginning. And I've, I'll be making a speech to a bunch of bankers up in Paris, Texas, next Wednesday night on the, the Fed and why the Fed and the FDIC have been the two worst things that's ever happened to the banking industry and to the American economy. That's another issue. Um, the finalists this year's world's greatest liar competition are Democrat leaders and Republican leaders. He says it's a toss-up. I think that's probably right. But here's what Henry Paulson knew. He was only the Secretary of the Treasury in March of 2008. He said, it's as strong as I've ever seen it in my business career. Financial institutions are strong, he added in March of 2008. Our banks are strong. They're going to be strong for many, many years. That was the Secretary of the Treasury in March of 2008. I point out to most of you know that Henry Paulson was the former head of Goldman Sachs. I'm glad you guys sold that stuff to Goldman Sachs. They are my least favorite uh, deal. There are many of those people, in my opinion, who should be in jail uh, but are not. And uh, I just keep hoping that the statute doesn't run out until they put some of them in jail. 
But again, I don't have a strong opinion about that either. Um, I'm going to get to Barney Frank in a minute. Let me see where this is. Oh, yeah, that's, that's what he said in March. Here's what he said to his wife in September of that year. What if the system collapses? I asked my wife, everybody's looking to me, and I don't have the answer. I'm really scared. Well, Hank, <laughs> you, you, sh you should have been scared. Let me, let me show you what he also said here. This is what he said about Citigroup's mortgage-backed securities on October 31st, 2007. I can't say this strongly enough with this AAA-rated paper, the highest-rated paper. Most of the issues we're dealing with here are not credit issues, okay? Most of them are liquidity issues, and the mortgages are backing up that paper of high-quality mortgages. That's your Secretary of the Treasury, October 31st, 2007. Now, that's an interesting date for a couple of reasons. I sent this quote over to my friend Dick Bowen, who teaches at UTD as well. How many of you know Dick Bowen, the Citigroup whistleblower? Okay, Mahesh does, and several of you do over here. So bear with me a second as I go all over the ballpark here. But this October 31st, 2007, I did not notice this thing, and I sent it to him over the weekend. So let me tell you what happened on November the 1st, 2007. The institute that I now run was started by a guy named Dr. Connie Constance, great guy, and unfortunately died early this year. But I got a chance to moderate the conferences long before I got involved with UTD, and I was moderating one on November the 1st, 2007, one day after this. The keynote speaker that he had lined up that year was a guy named um, Mike Oxley. Perhaps you've heard the name Mike Oxley, um, as in Sarbanes Oxley. Mike Oxley was an interesting guy, and he was talking about how important corporate governance was and how important all this stuff is and how important Sarbanes Oxley was. He told an interesting story as another aside. He was in China a few weeks before that time, and he had a young, he was making a speech on what was happening in governance in the U.S., and, and this young Chinese guy came up to him after and says, he said, sure, like, I'm glad, glad to meet you, Mr. Sarbanes Oxley. And he said, no, my name is Mike Oxley. And it was Paul Sarbanes and Mike. He said, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I so much wanted to meet Mr. Sarbanes Oxley because I never got to meet Mr. Glass-Steagall. You know, so it was, and for those of you in the banking business know it's a glass deal. That's a whole other issue which we may talk about. So anyway, November 1st, I'm introducing Mike Oxley the day after this thing happened. In the audience that day was a guy named Dick Bowen, who at that time was the uh, head of the business underwriting, buying mortgages for Citigroup, which they then uh, repackaged and sold. And he was the chief business underwriter located out here in Las Colinas. And he heard what Mike Oxley said and what I said talking about corporate governance. He had been trying to tell his bosses at Citigroup that the stuff they were buying was totally bogus. 60% of all of the loans they were buying did not meet their own criteria, 60%, and then gust up to 80%. The documentation wasn't there, the loan to value wasn't there, none of that. They were buying a bunch of crap and then packaging the crap and selling the crap, basically. You know? So CRA has a P on the end of it. Community Reinvestment Act, PAP. Okay, there we are with crap. Anyway, they're selling those. So he heard what we had to say on November the 1st, which was a Thursday. Went back to his office on November 2nd, and then on the morning of November 3rd, on Saturday morning, he penned the famous email to Robert Rubin. And the, Robert Rubin was, at that time, vice chairman of the board of city. He was notifying the board of directors that we had suggested that he do. He, he copied the chief risk officer, the chief accounting officer, and the chief financial officer at Citigroup. Based upon that email, he said, look, I'm telling you, I've been trying to get through to everybody here that we're buying a bunch of mortgages that are not any good. They're not, they don't meet our criteria, we're packaging them, et cetera. Based upon that nice thing that he did, he got fired. That's when he became the Citigroup whistleblower. Citigroup continued to do this for years. One of his employees stayed there in a Kansas City office. She sued Citigroup two years later after, it was actually right about the time Dodd-Frank came out, but she sued under another thing, which I don't want to get into all the technicality. Citigroup paid a $189 million fine. She personally got a check for $31 million. $31 million. Okay. Unfortunately, Dick Bowen didn't get any of that because he should have. But the fact is, all this stuff was going on, not just with Fannie and Freddie. Of course, Citigroup was selling to Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie drove it. Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Bear Stearns, Lehman, you name them, all involved in this up to their rear ends. And so once they found out how much money they could make and sell this stuff all over the world, then they drove all of this other stuff down the pipeline to all these sleazy mortgage brokers saying, give us more, give us more, give us more, and they gave them more, ladies and gentlemen. And that's how it all sort of um, rolled out. 
Anyway, so Paulson did, had, had no idea what he was talking about, which is not unusual for people with Goldman Sachs. Um, and this was, uh, the, one of the things he talked about was AAA rated stuff. One of the other causes there you'll see. This is a Vice President Moody's in 1957. He says, we cannot ask payment for rating a bond. To do so would attach a price to the process, and we could not escape the charge, which would undoubtedly come, that our ratings are for sale. Now, what, what happened to Standard Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, those are the big three, uh, the NRSROs, as they are called. The SEC went in, in the 1970s, and most people don't know this, and they blessed these three rating agencies with holy water and said, you are now nationally recognized statistically, statistical rating organizations. And before, they were just, you know, they were out there rating a few pieces of paper. People who bought their ratings were people who invested as opposed to the people who actually issued the stuff. And so they said, we want you guys to be the guys. And so then every bank, every regulator in the world said, you've got to have stuff that's rated by these three organizations. And we made these people filthy rich. And they started then getting rating, not, not paid by the people who used their ratings, but paid by the people whose bonds they were rating. You know, a small conflict of interest in corporate governance, wouldn't you say just a small conflict? And if it didn't meet your criteria, then if you just tweak it here and tweak it there and give us another $15 million, we'll give you AAA. So all of this is really sort of tied together, and I apologize for it being such a long story. Neil Borofsky, anybody know who Neil Borofsky is? That's one of those books, uh, by the way. He was the, uh, uh, the guy, the Inspector General for TARP, the Troubled Asset Program, $700 billion bailout. Here's what he said. Securities ratings have proven to be unreliable, largely irrelevant. The wholesale failure of the credit rating agencies to adequately rate the securities at the heart of the process, if not the primary cause of the current financial crisis with the security agencies. That's what he thought. Here's, <laughs> by the way, that deal is ridiculous. That's a standard employee's ploy. This is emails. It could be structured by cows and we would rate it. That's what the colleague's response was. So all this stuff going on at, at uh, the CRA, they knew it was bogus stuff. They're all getting paid a bunch of money, so what the heck, who cares? The rating agencies, of course, have sued and said, you know, it's just an opinion. It's freedom of speech. It's the First Amendment, so you can't sue us. And the U.S. Court of Appeals actually found for them in May of 2011. Now, what's happened in the last few months? One of the things that's happened is the federal government has sued the rating agencies, which I find interesting. Um, they sued them for $5 billion just last month. And so we'll see what happens. They only sued Standard & Poor's. Standard & Poor's was the only one, other than Egan, uh, who, who did it first, who downgraded U.S. debt. <laughs> and so there's some questions whether that was retaliation. I don't know if it was or not. I would downgrade the U.S. debt, not to AA+. Plus. I'd downgrade it to about a C- minus. is where I'd downgrade it. But what the heck do I know? I don't know. What the heck. Um, I'm not going to deal with that one. Regulators, obviously the regulators have no clue. They've never had a clue. The regulators will never have a clue. Why is that? Put yourself in this position. You're a regulator making $150,000 a year, and you're dealing with people who make two or three or four million dollars a year. Now, who's smarter? It's a tough question, is it? Who's got the biggest lawyers? Who writes the laws to start with? Lawyers. Who gets around the law? Lawyers. Who has the money? Lawyers, banks, rating agencies, etc. And the regulators are mostly nice people. I'm not saying they're not nice people. It's just by definition, you ain't the brightest star in the sky, folks. It isn't going to happen. And so you're not going to be able to do it from a regulatory standpoint. It can't happen. And there's regulatory capture. You don't think the banks own the regulators? You don't think Big Pharma owns FDA? I mean, they all own those people. It's all regulatory capture. It's not a new concept. You've been around it for a while, so have I. Alan Meltzer talking about the Fed. Um, <laughs> this time is different. Yeah, that's a great book, too. Uh, the GSE. So here's Ross Levine, an autopsy of the U.S. financial system. Accident, suicide, or negligent homicide. Two policies combined to expand the mortgage market for GSEs. Expansion of the affordable housing mission of GSEs, the Community Reinvestment Act. There it was in 77. In the mid-90s, HUD and Congress added an affordable housing mission to the GSEs. That was in the mid-90s under uh, Clinton. Between 2005 and 2007, they bought approximately a trillion in mortgages with subprime characteristics, which accounted for about 45% of the mortgages purchased. Now, we had under Bill Clinton, and by the way, I've got, you, that's the problem with this. I loved overhead transparencies. I could just get to the ones I needed and say the heck with the rest of them. But anyway, feature this, a guide, uh, people driving down in front of the White House in 
in, uh, on Pennsylvania Avenue. And one of them says, to, the guy says to his wife, he said, remember, honey, when all we had to worry about was the president's sex life? Does anybody remember those days? Those were, those were really, really cool days, in, in my opinion. So we had somebody running HUD named Henry Cisneros. Perhaps many of you have heard of good old Henry Cisneros, former mayor of uh, San Antonio down there, nice guy. I ran into him at an airport in Baltimore one year. We had a nice conversation back in this time. Cisneros was uh, uh, not exactly on the straight and narrow. It wasn't just the fact that he was paying his mistress to keep quiet. That was a whole other deal. But uh, here's what Cisneros said in 2003. There's never been a better time to become a homeowner. He was head of HUD back before, and he helped loosen mortgage restrictions in the middle 1990s. And he left in 1997 with this uh, scan uh, scandal with his mistress. He got in the home building business. He was on KB Homes' board. He was on Countrywide's board for six years. I'm sure there's no conflict between a guy who was head of HUD and being on Countrywide's board in KB Homes. I'm sure this is simply a coincidence. In corporate governance, we would say this is, this is absolutely the way it ought to be done. No conflicts of interest at all. So, um, so he got involved in those kind of things, made a bunch of money. Now, this is something I just found in my many files over the last few days, and I've been doing the homework for this. This is from the Dallas Morning News, January 23rd, 2009, uh, Bob Miller's column. Henry Cisneros, chairman of City View, former mayor of San Antonio, will deliver the 10th luncheon address at the 10th annual North Texas Housing Coalition Summit. You know, the event is scheduled from uh, 7 to 2 p.m. 11 coalition members will be honored. A breakfast panel of North Texas mayors will discuss the necessity of regional housing strategy. Now, that's what I want is a bunch of politicians talking about regional housing strategy because those folks right there on the cutting edge knowing real estate really well. Arlington Mayor Robert Cluck will lead the discussion. Tom Leppert. Oh, Tom Leppert. I like Tom, by the way. He's a good guy. Uh, what board was Tom Leppert on during this time? Actually, he hadn't, wasn't still on it here because it happened before. Tom Leppert served on a board called WAMU. Perhaps you've heard of Washington Mutual. Tom Leppert was on WAMU's board from the early 2000s until they closed it, and J.P. Morgan ended up with it as well. The largest bank failure in history, and that's the board Tom Leppert was on. I asked him. Uh, when he was mayor and talking about the hotel over here, what he thought about that, he said, well, I can't talk about it right now. And I said, okay, fine. So let's see. Oh, unfortunately, it was, uh, this panel was moderated by Kimberly Aaron of the University of Texas at Dallas. That's kind of interesting. She's now gone now. And who are the sponsors of this conference in January 2009? This is after the crunch. Countrywide Bank. Hmm. Chase. Hmm. City. Washington Mutual and Wells Fargo. Cool. I love Love all that, too. Uh, good for Cisneros, is all I can say. Now, by the way, he wasn't the only one who served on these things. There's a guy named Rahm Emanuel. Perhaps you've heard of Rahm Emanuel. Rahm Emanuel was on the board of, um, let's see, which one was I think he was on the board of Countrywide or IndyMac. I can't remember which. He served on the board for about 13 months and made $320,000. So good old Rahm knew what he was doing, too. Now he's running Chicago, which is even more broke than the federal government, which is a really hard thing to do, by the way. Really hard. Okay, this is Wallace, and that's what he said on 939. Here's Barney Frank. In 2002, he said, I don't, re I don't regard Fannie and Freddie as problems. I regard them as great assets. In 2003, he said, there's no federal guarantee of Fannie and Freddie. Now, here's the guy who in 2003 uh, was, at that, at that particular time, he was either the um, minority leader on the House Banking Committee, or he was head of the House Banking Committee, depending on who had control, I forget. A month later, after Freddie Mac's accounting scandal, by the way, Freddie Mac had an accounting scandal too, he said, I don't think we're facing any kind of a crisis. That's what Barney Frank said. In April 2004, after Fannie announced his financial misstatement, Congressman Frank says, I think Wall Street will get over it. Now, the reason that Barney Frank, and Barney Frank, by the way, is obviously not one of my favorite people, but he's not a stupid man. He's not a stupid man. Uh, he was getting a lot of his campaign contributions from Fannie and Freddie. That, I'm sure, that didn't affect his judgment at all. His uh, life partner at the time, in 19, from 1991 to 1998, was a guy named Herb Moses. Herb Moses worked developing new products for Fannie Mae. I'm sure absolutely that was no conflict of interest either. I'm fairly sure that was not a, a factor. So um, all these people up here, I think, probably really did believe that Fannie and Freddie were great organizations and that they went, there, was, there was an implicit guarantee, which is why they were able to borrow money so cheaply, but it wouldn't be explicit that the government would ever have to bail them out, right? Could never happen. Of course, that happened, of course, when we put them in conservatorship in 2008. By the way, Barney Frank did agree in 2010 that we ought to close Fannie and Freddie. 
So he at least uh, uh, got the quit drinking the Kool-Aid after a while. So that's Fannie and Freddie, and that's Barney Frank. Well, that's what they said about Barney Frank. So I, you guys can talk about investing in real estate, but I, here's the real investment, folks, right here. Buy a congressman. Um, and that's what happened during this whole crisis. Uh, and they were bald on both sides of the aisle, by the way. This is not just a Democratic issue. If it were, it might be a little easier to see. But, and by the way, George, a, George W. Bush uh, had the American Dream Act. And the, remember, remember making these announcements in the Rose Garden about how we're going to make homes of war? It was George Bush just as much as these other people. And so I guess I'll tell you my George Bush story. So it was April 2009. Bush was out of the White House for, uh, for three months building his office uh, down the, actually down here, Park, Park City, in the, where the Park City Club is. And he was officing another building uh, a block away while that office was being reconstructed for him. And um, I knew he was in the building because there were uh, a lawyer that I'd do some business, some real estate business with there was uh, in the building. And he said, yeah, he, he offices here temporarily. So I went up there to get this real estate done, deal done in April of 2009. And I got off the elevator on the eighth floor, and there were a couple of young men standing there with ties on and the little earpieces. And I said, the president is on the floor. And he was on the floor. Actually, he was in their offices. And these were three um, nice, conservative, Catholic lawyers in their firm and their assistants. And they were being regaled by the president about this, that, and the other. And they said, Mr. President, we just love, we just love you, what you did for stem cell research or didn't do for stem cell research. We just loved your position on abortion, and we just think you're the greatest president, and blah, blah, blah. And so he was signing autographs for people, and one, my, mother would, my mother would like one, and he, would, he reached over the copy machine, and he would grab a piece of paper and sign one for his mother. Oh, my, my brother would love one, and he grabbed another piece of paper. And, and it was just an interesting conversation. I just sort of stood over here to the side and didn't, uh, didn't participate in the conversation. And finally, the, the conversation died down. The president looks at me and said, Dennis, you haven't had anything to say. I said, well... Mr. President, Frank, I wasn't all that enamored with your presidency. <laughs> he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let's take the bailout. He said, well, he said, wait a minute, let's talk about the." He said, let me tell you. He said, let me ask you this question. Say, I'm sitting in the Oval Office, right? Here comes Secretary Cox of the SEC. Here comes Secretary Paulson of the Treasury. Here comes Ben Bernanke. And they come into my office in September of 2008, and they say, Mr. President, if we don't bail out AIG and these banks, we're going to have a worldwide depression. What would you have done? That's a good question. So I thought for a minute, and I said, well, I'll tell you what I would have done. I think I would have done what Ludwig von Mises said he would have done when one of his students asked him that question when he was teaching at NYU in 1942. Now, I'm not sure at this point if he ever heard of Ludwig von Mises, number one, but for those of you here, probably most of you know one of the most famous Austrian economists of all time. He was talking about the Great Depression. And he was talking about the houses that had been foreclosed. He was talking about the banks that had closed in the Great Depression. Terrible time. And a student said to me, what, Professor Mises said, what if you had been Hoover, who helped create the problems, by the way, there's another Republican, or Roosevelt, you mean, you, mean you, you wouldn't have done all these government things? He said, no, I would have done nothing. But I would have started doing nothing much sooner. So let's think about this for a minute. I would have started doing nothing much sooner. Now the president said to me, he said, Dennis, you know, we tried to fix Fannie and Freddie in 2003, 2004, but Barney Frank and the Democrats weren't having it. I said, I give you credit. You know, even Alan Greenspan figured out by 2003, 2004 that there was a problem with Fannie and Freddie and all this. Even he got it after a while. And I said, I understand that. But I'm just saying when you start with the situation uh, of building this in in 1938 is when we had Fannie Mae was formed to increase the market for mortgages. It was taken public in 1968 under LBJ because they had a budget deficit problem and he wanted to get that off budget so they made it a public corporation so we could privatize the profits and socialize the losses, which is what we've just done. Then 1970, Freddie Mac was formed to again increase mortgage stuff. Now, I hate to say this in a group that's all about real estate, Mahesh, so I'm apologizing to you about this, but for every depression, recession we've ever had, there's always been a real estate boom preceding it, every one of them. Okay. 
Real estate is the investment of choice. Stocks, obviously, we've had that in the 20s as well. But real estate, and real estate for a lot of reasons. So much so that banks in the 50s, when I first started working in my dad's, the bank that my dad worked in, under the state banking laws here in Texas, you couldn't make a real estate loan without 50% down payment. 50% down payment, right? Okay. And so now we've changed it not only from no 50% down payment, but not no 20% down payment. FHA, we didn't talk about FHA. They're broke as they can possibly be, too. Federal Housing Administration, that started in 1934. 3% um, down. They said, well, we get to pay 3% down. Well, you could do some home improvement loans if it was just what you were improving it was, and the FHA actually guaranteed those. But you're right, we couldn't have home equity loans in Texas until 1996, as I recall. Uh, and because, and now the home equity loans were pretty stringent here. Texas missed this last depression, not to, for least of which is, is because we actually protected homeowners from them stupid selves, you know. And I hate to say it that way, but that's basically what happened. And we didn't have a land use restrictions here. We could build anywhere we wanted to go. We could build a Frisco, Coppell, every other place you can imagine. Whereas in California, oh no, you can't, oh no, 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 no. You can't build here. This is uh, environmentally protected, or it's just pretty, or it's whatever. And so that's one of the reasons why real estate is so expensive. By the way, 40 years ago, real estate in, in Georgia and real estate in California about the same, same uh, price, by the way. You know, what, the, what the difference is, is not just the view. I can assure you that. Anyway, that's a whole other issue. Let me move on here. A couple of other things. Oh, me. So here's where the Dodd-Frank bill was signed. And here, here are the culprits, all of them. There's one right here, Maxine Waters. She's interesting. Uh, many of you know Jeb Henschelling, I assume. Most of you know Jeb. Jeb's been a friend of mine since long, before he ran for Congress. I talked to him at a wedding uh, a couple of months ago, and I said, what's it like dealing with Maxine Waters instead of Barney Frank? <laughs> he said, well, it's interesting. He said, Barney Frank was not a stupid man, which I've known uh, before. Um, but Barney Frank would be uh, all over the ballpark in terms of politics and all this. He said, Maxine Waters on the other hand is, um, how should I put this? Well, you said illiterate, I didn't. Okay, so anyway, not as smart as Barney Frank. How's that? So anyway, so you've got issues there on, on that side of the uh, equation here. Um, so I want to talk about the Fed. Uh, the Fed is underlying all of this stuff here. We couldn't have done all this stuff without the Fed. Uh, now, by the way, we have the Financial Stability Oversight Council. And we didn't touch Fannie and Freddie under the Dodd-Frank Act, by the way. They're out of money, so you lose. There's, here's the taxpayer. There's Fannie and Freddie. And if you get too big to fail, we're going to bail you out again. So there, that's, that's Wall Street. So let me talk about Wall Street and, uh, and the Fed, if I may. So Wall Street, um, certainly culpable in all this stuff. Um, we have, in this country, in my opinion, what's called crony capitalism. Uh, there's a revolving door between the folks in Wall Street and the folks in Washington, D.C. Through that revolving door is not just Hank Paulson. There's a guy named Robert Rubin. Perhaps you've heard the name. Robert Rubin was Secretary of the Treasury in 1998. He's the one that helped bail out the people who had invested in Mexico in 1994. <laughs> but that money went to Mexico and then came back to the Wall Street bankers here. Robert Rubin uh, got helped get rid of Glass-Steagall. A lot of people think that was... Part of the problem, I'm not totally sure that it was. But in any event, Citigroup merged with Travelers, which wasn't possible under Glass-Steagall. So politically, they got it done. And then who hired Robert Rubin right after that? That would be Citigroup. Citigroup hired him for $15 million a year as vice chairman of Citigroup and no responsibility. Apparently, Citigroup wasn't responsible for anything. He, wasn't, he was irresponsible, I guarantee you that. But nevertheless, he worked for Citigroup. Who else worked for Citigroup? Larry Summers. You were talking about Larry Summers, obviously from a company a country standpoint, I'm sure glad Larry Summers didn't get the Fed thing, but you're right, it'd be a whole lot more conversation. Larry Summers was there as Undersecretary of the Treasury under Robert Rubin. Larry Summers ended up, uh, obviously, an advisor to the Obama uh, presidency. Larry Summers also worked for D.E. Shaw for a while, peddling these very same uh, mortgage-backed securities all over Japan and making millions of dollars a year in between his particular time in the government and out of the government and back in the government again. So that's what we've got at, at Wall Street, and it's, it still continues. Uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, it may be the best of the group. You can see what's happening with Jamie Dimon. 
present time too. By the way, Elizabeth Warren, this is what she thinks of me. This is Elizabeth Warren who had something to do with all this at the same time. So uh, here's the sex life thing, which I kind of like. So this is one that's kind of interesting. The banking failures for the current year have been numerous, many having been characterized by gross management and some criminality. The unfavorable conditions were greatly aggravated by the collapse of unwise speculation in real estate. Now that was kind of an interesting quote, but who said it and when? That's the question. Well, it was said by the Comptroller of the Currency, the regulator of national banks in 1891. So you can just take it all the way back to 1891, Mahesh. We've had these same issues going on here with real estate. There's Jamie Dimon. I thought it was an interesting picture in the Wall Street Journal. Jamie Dimon standing in front of a sign that says the Department of Justice. So um, the Fed. Now, if I'm, by the way, before I talk about the Fed, and I've had 10 or 15 minutes left, anybody else got any other causes we haven't talked about yet? Derivatives. derivatives. Great question, derivatives. So, so I get a call from uh, uh, UTD putting me in touch with a writer for uh, uh, CNBC.com when I was on vacation in May. And I said, great, I'll, I'm sitting in Taos just looking at the mountains, contemplating my navel, I guess, or whatever. This reporter calls me and he said, they're trying to change this derivative thing under Dodd-Frank and a lot of the senators in there trying to change it. And what, uh, can you talk to me about derivatives? I said, let me ask you a question. What do you understand about derivatives? He said, I don't know much about them. I said, good. I don't either. We're both on the same place. He said, great. We, we had a really good conversation. So on the one hand, am I nervous about derivatives? Yes, I am. And they've gone from almost nothing to over $700 trillion around the world. Does anybody understand them? I don't think so. Are there reasons why you would hedge your bet on things that are legitimate, like hedging fuel bets, hedging agriculture? Yeah, I mean, that, that's part of commerce, has been forever. Uh, are there reasons why you would hedge your bet if you're selling mortgage-backed securities and, and issue with credit default swaps and all that? Yeah, exactly. So I have not seen any evidence, Larry, I have not seen the evidence that says that derivatives directly contributed to the problem. In fact, I could make the case that some of the derivatives were actually worked a whole lot better than some of the other things and maybe, maybe alleviated some of the problems. Now that's, that's to say I'm, I'm still really, really nervous about them because on, on one side of the thing, somebody's got to pick, step up and say something. The right? the other, and that's the problem. Has the other shoe fallen? Have we learned anything? Which is the second half of this. The answer to that, in my opinion, is no. It hasn't fallen. And so I'm concerned about it, but I'm not sure that it was totally part of the real cause. Okay, anybody else? Causes. Well, devaluation of the dollar. Yeah, well, that's a Fed issue, obviously. Uh, it, the whole thing is about devaluation of the dollar over time. Um, does, does, it, does anybody in here old enough? Well, Larry, anybody in here old enough to remember this? When I got out of college at SMU, not UTD, because UTD wasn't around at the time. When I got out of college, I just said to myself, you know, if I could just make $20,000 a year, I would be wealthy. Does anybody remember that? Anybody remember those days? Yeah. And I've, I've asked people before, and I, the really old people, usually Rotarians, say, I remember it was $10,000 a year, whatever. Isn't that true? We, we, and that's because, and as Milton Friedman said so many times, it's always a monetary phenomenon. It's always a Fed phenomenon. The Federal Reserve, and that's a speech I'll be making next week, the Federal Reserve was formed on December 23, 1913. So we're about to celebrate the 100-year anniversary in a couple of months. Since that time, the value of the dollar has fallen 97%. 97%. We have systematically ruined anything that talks about sound money over that time. And the Fed was formed for one reason and one reason only, by big banks or big banks. Uh, I suspect many of you have read The um, Creature from Jekyll Island, other things like that. But for those of you who have an interesting story, 1910, six bankers from New York decided to go duck hunting in Brunswick, Georgia. They got on a train in the middle of the night. They didn't use their own names with the porters around the train. They took names of other people. And by the way, one of the bankers called himself Orville. Another banker called himself Wilbur. Why? Because in, in December 17th, 1903, just seven years before, we'd had the first flight. So Orville and Wilbur were pretty well known. So Orville and Wilbur. They took the train down to Brunswick, Georgia, took a boat over to Jekyll Island, Georgia, and that is where they concocted what became the Federal Reserve System. All you got to do is go to Jekyll Island, Georgia, and you can see the room, and they did it. You see the people's names there. It's just not a question of my opinion. It's just fact. Uh, so it ended up becoming the Fed in 1913. 
So it was all about big banks and all about bailing out big banks. But what they were trying to fix was a broken system. And again, I can't, I'm going to take you back to 1863 when the National Banking Act is what screwed things up for 50 years. And then they tried to fix it by doing something else which was worse. And that's what government does. They screw up something. It gets to be a problem, so we pass something else. That screws something else up, so we've passed something else, and we keep passing something else. And so the only law I know of that works in Washington, D.C., is a law of unintended consequences. That's the only one I'm aware of. So, yeah. And then we got this devaluation of the dollar. We have a huge trade deficit, which fights adds up all this stuff, too. Well, it's, it's a different world with hedge funds. And, and I just went over this with my class last night about what hedge funds are. And trying to define what a hedge fund is is in itself a difficult thing. But let's just say it's a bunch of people. Let's take Bill Ackman as the greatest example out here with J.C. Penney. We all know about Bill Ackman, great hedge fund guy, don't you think? Only cost his investors $700 million for this um, uh, little fiasco out here in, uh, in North Dallas. So um, hedge funds by themselves, neither good or bad. What they do with their money depends. But if they have, um, let's say, a lot of power and the ability to leverage that is where we get into trouble. Most of you remember long-term capital management, which got in trouble in 1998. It's the smartest people in the world, allegedly, John Merriweather and those folks. And Greenspan got the big banks together and bailed them out without taxpayer money in 1998. Now, their money can move all over the world very quickly these days, and we know it. The leverage issue is, is a huge issue. And let me just talk about the leverage for a second. The date was April 28, 2004. Bill Donaldson was head of the SEC. At the time, he got a call from Henry Paulson who was head of Goldman Sachs at the time, and, and Paulson, along with the head of Morgan Stanley, uh, Lehman, Bayer, and I can't remember who the other fourth, fifth one was, went to visit with, with Donaldson and his staff and said, listen, this guy, this idea about the net capital rule that we need to have so much capital behind their stuff, this needs to go away. We're big boys. We can do what we want. And Donaldson said, okay, we'll regulate you in a different way, but okay, don't worry about having any capital. So when Lehman closed, they were leveraged 34 to 1, Bear close, 32 to 1, et cetera. And that is, if their assets depreciated by 3%, they were broke, you know, is what it amounted to. And they were broke very, very quickly. This was not a liquidity issue. Uh, Bernanke still thinks it's a liquidity. This was a credit quality issue. Liquidity is everywhere. It's everywhere now. Is there any way out? Of the, did anybody see any way out for the Fed? You know, they've grown their balance sheet from $800 billion to $3.8 trillion in the last four years, quantitative easing. Anybody see any way out for that? I'd like to talk to you afterwards if you have a way out. A couple of things about have we learned anything. I don't think we've learned one darn thing, frankly. Uh, I, I'd like to say we have. Now, the good news is the, the real bankers have gotten more stringent with their credit quality, and they should, you know, and they should. Uh, the other bankers, I admit, didn't really matter. Uh, there, I didn't have any idea that J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs were involved in, in storing commodities in Chicago and Minneapolis. Anybody know, did anybody know that? You knew it. I didn't even know it. That came out as part of the um, Glass-Steagall, as a matter of fact, gave them the ability to run commodities. What a stupid thing that is. But anyway, hello, Jamie. Sorry about that. Now, I, no, the gods didn't ask for the sacrifice of a banker. It just seemed like a really good idea. I don't know about you, but I thought that's a really good idea, too. Um, bankers, when they were real bankers back in the 1800s, had a capital ratio, in this particular case, of over 50%. And you can see what happened all during these times. We had the Banking Act of 1863, which enabled to lower the amount of capital that they hold. And then we had the Fed right in here, lowered the capital that they've hold, held. And so once, once you're so leveraged uh, that you, you can't get out of a, of a crisis, therein lies the problem. And don't assume malice for what stupidity can explain, by the way. Some of these people are just stupid. That's the problem. Uh, here's what Milton Friedman said. No major institution, the Fed, has so poor record performance over so long a period yet so high a public reputation. So what we do with Dodd-Frank, we made them, the, basically we didn't call them the super regulator, but the Fed is in charge of everything. So that creates a problem. And what's the Fed done to the dollar? Here's the other. This is inflation since 1800. Under the gold standard, a real gold standard, from this period of time, we had a few fluctuations here, a little war of 1812. We had a little issue here called the Civil War. We had a little issue over here called World War I, et cetera. But until right here, Basically, a dollar in 1913 would buy you the same goods that would buy in 1813. This is what happened since the Fed right here. And, of course, the big event under Tricky Rick, Dick Nixon, August 15, 1971, when we cut the ties with gold and quit redeeming. That was August 15, 1971. So you can see what's happened to the Consumer Price Index since that time.
this is the thing you ought to be concerned about, U.S. bank loan growth. You can see, obviously, the drop down here in this time, and then the back up here, but look where it is uh, at the moment. That's something that should get our attention, I think. And here's the situation in the Eurozone. Uh, the drop here in this particular point of time, the increase back to here, and now that's going down the other way. Let me close with two things. First of all, bail them out. Hell, back in 1990, the government seized the Mustang Ranch brothel in Nevada for tax evasion. And as required by law, tried to run it. They failed and it closed. Now, we're trusting the economy of our country, our banking system, our auto industry, and possibly our health plans to the same nitwits who couldn't make money running a whorehouse and selling whiskey. What were we thinking? That's all I can ask. What were we thinking? Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Appreciate it.